good morning and welcome uh, to Getting to Grips with Your Photographic Collections. Uh, my name is Linda Ramsey and I am Chair of the Preservation Committee. This series is organised by Robert Wright, uh, Communities and Operations Officer for Scottish Council of Archives, working with Susie Clark today, who is a key field leader in, the field, in photographic conservation. The aim of today's presentation is to give context and form, but also to be an enjoyable way to build expertise and confidence for owners and custodians of collections. There will be an opportunity to pose questions in the questions and answers box at the end of the presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Susie Clark, Photographic Conservator and Consultant, and I'm accredited by the Institute of Conservation. Welcome to this series on how to get to grips with your photographic collection. For this series, I've assumed that perhaps you don't know too much about photographic processes. I've also assumed that perhaps you have one or two uh, collections, but that maybe you don't know quite where to start with assessing what you have. My aim is to break that down so it seems a bit more manageable for you and I also want to fire up your enthusiasm for photographs. Too often people miss the significance of what they have in their photographic collections. So photographs often have many interesting and wonderful qualities and you just have to learn how to appreciate them and to really look at them. Today I'm going to tell you a bit about how to begin identifying your photographs. Why does that matter? Well, many reasons. So much information is associated with the choice of a type of photograph and it puts the photograph into context. So I like to see it as a dialogue and it isn't just the subject matter of the image which should be speaking to you. For example, the choice of process may tell you something about the social standing of a sitter, their interests or personality, uh, what traits or aspects of an image that they wish to emphasise. And it can also tell you quite a bit about the photographer. Were they an art photographer, a documentary photographer, photojournalist, a scientist, a company photographer, or a local town photographer, for example. Equally, knowledge of those things may tell you something about what the process is likely to be. So I like to see it as a conversation. It's a sort of two-way stream. The choice of the image, the process and the photographer feed into each other and you as the viewer should be part of the conversation and also seeing these things. So there are different ways of looking at photographs and dividing them into different groups or organising them. But the first thing is to define what a photograph actually is. And at its simplest, a photograph is an image produced by the action of light, which causes a visible and chemical change to a surface. But there is also a view that a photograph has to be made using a camera. Some photographs, as you'll see in this example, what we might think of as photographs are made by placing objects directly on a light sensitive surface and exposing it to light without a camera. So the definition is somewhat fluid. For the purposes of this series, we are talking about a photograph as a physical manifestation rather than the transient nature of data. The production of a digital image may start with a change caused by the action of light, but after that the data will usually become divorced from the original surface which was affected by light. The conservation of digitally generated images, which require hardware and software to interpret them, is a substantial area of discussion by itself, and we won't be covering that here. For these webinars I'd like to point out that I'm going to be covering the most common photographic processes. There are some rarer photographic processes which you're unlikely to see most of the time. 
However, if you have an unusual or an offbeat sort of photographic collection, uh, you should bear that in mind that they may occur. Archives don't always cater very well for uh, organising groups of photographs. And it's fair to say that museums have been more ready to acknowledge the different qualities of photographs because they begin by viewing a photograph as an object. However, uh, we need to start by looking at the ways that you can divide up photographic collections and what concepts and terms are involved. First, the concept of negatives and positives. When light hits a light-sensitive surface of an unexposed photographic material, it causes it to change. And in the case of silver images, light from an object causes light-sensitive silver halide salts to form silver particles, which will be dark. So what was light in the original object becomes dark in the photograph. Now, how do you get round that? You need to make that first generation image transparent, so in effect it acts as a mask. You then shine light through that first generation image onto a second light sensitive surface and this one will be correctly exposed. So that first generation image is a negative where light and dark are reversed and the second one becomes a positive where they're correct. The majority of photographs prior to digital photography were produced in this two-step way, although there are some exceptions. The next concept I want to talk about is that of format. And format can mean two different things in photography. And unfortunately that happens quite a bit in photography in that the terminology is not always very clearly used. But I'll attempt to clarify these as we go along. Format can be used to refer to size or it can be used to refer to the style of presentation. So, for example, a 35mm film negative or a quarter plate gelatin glass negative is a format by size. But a lantern slide and a photograph in a passbar 2 or frame are also different formats. The third concept is that of black and white and colour. Now you'd think there'd be no ambiguity here, but I'm afraid that there is. Photographers have traditionally used the phrase black and white to mean a print with a silver image as opposed to one of the alternative processes, that is, alternative to silver. So a black and white print can be true black and white or it can be sepia coloured. And alternative processes can be variously black and white sepia or any of a number of colours just as long as it's one colour because they could also be made from pigments. Alternative processes aren't referred to as black and white unless it is done in a very conscious deliberate way. This may have quite a bit of significance. A silver print which is factually black and white will have a set of different qualities, properties and uses from say a platinum print which is factually black and white, which will be used in quite a different context. And you can see here that you've got uh, black and white photographs and sepia under the silver processes, and you've also got black and white and sepia under the alternative processes. I also see large modern prints, which are reproductions of earlier silver black and white photographs, but are actually chromogenic prints. That's quite commonly done for the very large face-mounted photographs you often see on display. The fourth concept I want to talk about is that of originals. What is an original? Obviously, in most cases, the negative is the earliest version of an image. But as it wasn't intended to be the final result, a print may often be considered an original. However, there might be several prints from a negative, possibly at different times and now in varying condition. Some may have been cropped, retouched, either for blemishes or artistic effect. And some photographers work with photographic and photomechanical processes. So these issues can have an impact on acquisition, appraisal and cataloguing. And I would point out that if you acquire the contents of a photographic studio, 
logbooks can be very helpful and provide a lot of information. Now let's look at this example because it illustrates very well some of the points I've just made. Because on the left you have the original glass plate negative which dates from about the time of the First World War. On the right you have the enclosure that it was in. And then you have uh, the box that it came in which has two sequences of negatives, both glass and film. There's an index card for both, but that shows that the collection is not complete because some of the images are missing. And then this is the print which was produced at about the time of the negative. So this is a, a silver print and um, it's in an album, obviously. And then if you look here, you've got a cyanotype, which is a contemporary print produced recently from that original negative. But if you look at that original print alongside the more modern print made from the same negative, you can see there are differences. The one on the left was cropped. And also, if you look sort of in the bottom right corner of both images, you'll see that there's detail in the one on the left, whereas that detail isn't there in the one on the right. As you start to look at it closer, you can see there's some bleached spots in the area of the cat on the one on the left. And they're not there in the one on the right because those are in the print, they're not in the negative, so they haven't printed out in the image on the right. So when you start to look, you can see there's quite a few differences. Well, the cat is obviously a stand-in for other photographs. And if you imagine this was a photograph of quite a large group of people sort of spread about through the image area, then the differences might be quite significant and the amount of information that the images relayed uh, could be quite different too. So I think you can see that there are quite a few issues as to what is the original version. And here we've got the print that was produced at the time in the album with images depicting different kinds of subject matters as preparations for the First World War. So that's another issue. The discussion about what is the original has also resurfaced in recent years with regard to the fading of early colour chromogenic prints and reprinting, particularly in museums. Artists and photographers can have quite different views about whether the original should be replaced by a new original, whether it should be as close a copy as possible of what they think the old version originally looked like. Some take it as an opportunity to create something slightly different and others don't want anyone to know what they are seeing is a newer print. And yet others think of the fading as a part of natural ageing. After all, most 19th century prints look quite different from their original appearance, but we've accepted that, and many people probably think that's how they originally looked. Artists vary in how they want to see the different versions described and will also want to retain the value of their work. Some museums have resorted to acquiring two copies and using one for display. And there's also the issue of what to do with an older version if a photograph has been reprinted. If the first version of the image before it is printed is digital, things can be equally or more complicated. The concept of original is also important to digitisation. What are you trying to achieve? Digitisation is not just a blanket copying exercise. There are a number of practical, technical and ethical considerations and decisions which have to be made which are, are of specific relevance to photographs. One of these will be about the pictorial rendering intent which version of the image, including condition and the photographer's intention, do you propose to depict? A fifth way of dividing up photographic collections is by process, materials and structure. And this is primarily how you will identify a photographic process or groups of processes or group of processes to which a photograph belongs. There are 
a number of ways that photographs can be grouped and this is useful for the identification of processes and their care and conservation. You might think if you read some of the literature that photographic processes occur in isolation but in fact generally speaking they don't and this is where my background in biology becomes um, an asset because most photographic processes were adaptations of previous processes. So in fact it's like a process of evolution. Uh, you would have one process and one material in that process would be the weak link if you like and that material would be replaced with another material but everything about that process would stay the same but it gets another name, it becomes another process and so that's how processes mostly develop. It's rare that you get a new photographic process which is completely divorced from anything that came before it. So it's worth bearing that in mind. And it's the materials that mean that photographs look a certain way or behave in a certain way. It's not the process per se. So in practice this means that, for example, you can divide photographs by the support materials they're on. So here we can see paper, film, glass and metal. Or we can divide them by the type of emulsion. Most photographs have an emulsion, not all, but most do. So that would be namely albumin, collodion or gelatin. And then we can divide them up by the image forming substance. And in the case of black and white and one colour photographs, this will be silver, pigments or metal or metal compounds. What does this mean if we take a random print, for example? So here we've got uh, albumin print and we've got from the group of emulsions, we've got albumin. From the image forming substances, we've got silver. And from the support, we've got paper. And that's the process at its most sort of elemental. There might be further tweaks that were done to the process, but that's sort of the heart of it, if you like. And that's a very good way of thinking about photographs, that they are these different constituents from different groups. Finally, and this is the traditional way of dividing up photographic collections, which is by subject matter. So you can see we've got here photographs as Christmas cards, memorialising things, pictures of famous people that people might collect, postcards, people with their hobbies, landscapes, early photojournalism, all sorts of different uh, things, even Roman legionnaires in the Yorkshire Dales. So I think you can see you get very diverse subject matter, as I'm sure you're aware. But that's not necessarily the only thing that contributes information to a photograph. And I think you'll have realised that by some of the examples we've been looking at. So I'm trying to encourage you to think a bit more broadly about your photographic collections and all these different relevant aspects of the information that feed into photographs and that you can get from photographs. I hope from this introductory video that you've realised there's a lot more information within a photograph and how to start to visually appreciate it and assess it in context. In the coming videos we will be covering different groups of photographs in more detail and looking at aspects of their care. So I look forward to joining you then. Thank you, Susie. I'd just like to invite people to put any questions that they may have into the question and answer box. I should have introduced Susie before. I think technically I got uh, confused with what I was doing. Um, I do have one question so far. Um, Susie, can you reliably date photographs by the process used? Um, yes, to some extent. Um, some, re some photographs have been uh, revamped in recent years. So, and some of them had several periods of popularity, but generally speaking, it's a, you, that gives you a pretty good idea, but you have to be um, careful of these aberrations where processes were sort of brought back later on. 
and became popular at a later date. They were usually art processes, um, or certainly when they were revised, they were art processes. But there are occasional occasional exceptions. So um, yes, yes, it's quite useful to look for dating processes and photographs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions coming in? Uh, <clears throat> if not, I want to sort of again thank Susie, who's going to be our presenter for these this series of uh, webinars, and also to remind everyone to rejoin us um, on March the twenty fourth. Um, when we will be doing daguerreotypes, and ambrotypes, and tintypes, the presentation will be uh, that will be the presentation you'll be able to log in. And I think this presentation is available on YouTube, a recording of it. So if you want to review what we've already heard today, thank you for joining us. Thank you.